Thank you. 
and when you're asleep, he knows you better than anyone could ever. All of a sudden, I just want to find someone to love me. Someone who can know me for me. His name is Jesus. All right? It's not James. It's not Johnny. It's Jesus. And until you are satisfied in the love that the Father can give you, there is no love that a man can give you that will fill that hole. Every human being has a God-sized hole. And when we don't realize that it's a God-sized hole, we try to fill it up with other things. We try to fill it up with sex. We try to fill it up with drugs. We try to fill it up with money. We try to fill it up with relationships. We try to fill it up with perfectionism. We try to fill it up with people pleasing. Because we were all made to yearn for God. I'm sorry, I took off my shoes. I don't even know why I, I, I wear them. I never wear them. I don't need them. I don't need them. I'm just telling you, you know, some people don't. I, I, sorry. I apologize if you guys wear shoes on this stage. I'm a real African. <laughs> so other synonyms for chosen is elected, picked out, favored, set apart, or marked. How many of you guys have read my book, Marked? You didn't even know I had one, right? Don't worry. They're going to be here tomorrow. They're stuck on a plane somewhere right now, but we'll have them tomorrow. And that whole book is about what it means to be chosen, what it means to be set apart, what it means to be marked, and that's what we're talking about this weekend. So if we are a royal priesthood, if we are a chosen people, if we have a heritage, if we were, I call it an intentional design, you know what an intentional design is? God planned for you. He planned you out. He planned the steps that he has for your life. You're not a mistake. You're not, you know what they say about the earth that it just kind of popped out from nowhere. No. Everything about you is an intentional design. If that's true, then why do we not believe it? If that's true, then why do we not live it out? The enemy has lied to us about our identity. Identity is the number one area in which the enemy knows that if he can cause you to believe a lie, about who you are and who God says you are, then he's got you. And so he doesn't have a lot of tools. <clears throat> he's not very creative. He's not, he can't even create. He doesn't have the ability to create. Only God creates, right? And so what he does is he studies your past. He studies your bloodline. He studies your, your, uh, um, your patterns. He studies your behaviors. And through that, he begins to conceive kind of a story or a, a lie, really, about who you are. Let me drink some water. So he knows that if he can get you to believe that, you will never fulfill your purpose. The greatest threat that the enemy has is not about you being loved by God. It's about you recognizing who you are and then shifting the nations around you, the people around you, your family. Because this life is not just about you. There are people that are waiting for you to arise into your true identity. There are people that are waiting for you to speak up at work. There are people that are waiting for you to declare who God is and what he wants to do in their life. So how does he do this? I always love to get the story of Jesus, right? Stories had been told. There was a great king that was coming, right? But they didn't know when he was going to be born. And all of a sudden, something shifts in the atmosphere. The three wise men have a sense and they see the star and they begin this journey, right? The shepherds are gathering. And King Herod says, I hear that a king has been born. And he's telling the wise men this. I'm paraphrasing. When you found him, Tell me where he is so I can go and worship him. Now we know that his plan was not to go and worship him. King Herod wanted to be the only king. And so while the enemy doesn't know everything about you, he's sniffing around in your bloodline from the time that you're conceived, trying to locate you, trying to locate your family. Because if he can get to you early, maybe in the womb, maybe your mom says something like, I don't want this baby. All of a sudden, you have what we call neutral rejection, right? It happened while you were in the womb. Or maybe your mom and dad get in a fight and you, and you come out full of anxiety, full of uh, fear. You're just uptight. 
He's looking for entry points in your family and into your life as soon as he can get in there. And so that's what the enemy does. He's sniffing around. And so, of course, the three wise men find Jesus to worship him. Thank God I don't think they told Herod where Jesus was. He went on a rampage, started killing all the firstborn children. And some of you guys in this room, the enemy has been on a rampage in your family. And he may not have killed them physically, but he has killed destiny and he has killed purpose. There's some people who you look at them and say, you should have been this, you should have been that. But because he convinced them that they weren't able to be whatever God said they could be, they thwarted their destiny. The enemy knows that if he cannot kill you physically, he can kill you spiritually. So he begins in all kinds of ways. We forget that we are chosen because we're put in different types of circumstances. Some people it's poverty. Some people had money, but maybe they were molested. Some people were not molested, but maybe they were bullied at school. All these things are orchestrated by the enemy so that whatever lies come out of that experience is how you live your life out. And there has to come a point where you say, I am not my trauma. I am not my pain. I am not what I have been through. But you can only do that if you understand who God says you are. He says that you are a chosen people, that you are a royal priesthood. And I always say we've got to learn how to go from head knowledge to heart knowledge. Because a lot of us have been in church and we can quote the Bible, but we can't see it manifesting in our life. We can't see the fullness of it because we have an awareness, but we're not living it out on a daily basis. So the enemy is hoping that you will never step into it, that you will never believe it. And so this battle begins to rage, right? The first area in which the enemy comes after you is what we've started talking about. Who does God say I am? I love the story of Abraham. Not Abraham, Jacob. I love Abraham's story too, but Jacob. Jacob has this prophecy before he's even born that he's going to rule, he's going to reign. Same thing with Joseph when he's older, uh, when he's uh, a young child, God begins to talk to him about who he was going to be, right? Jacob, I don't know why his mama did this because his mama's the one who got the prophecy that this boy is going to be a leader, you know, he's going to be above and not beneath, and yet she names him Jacob. Jacob means swindler. It means deceiver. Now in Africa, we know that names have meaning. You don't just name your child whatever you want to name them. Because you're wondering what, why they're repeating grades, and you look up the meaning of their name, and it means dodo, or dumb one, right? Like, you got to, you got to do that research before you name your child. Don't just be like, ooh, little Shiana, that sounds pretty. I'm going to name my child that. And it means crazy one in Spanish, all right? Like, you've got to discern. And the, the Bible sets a precedence for that. So Jacob is called deceiver, and so what does Jacob do? He deceives. He deceives Esau. He goes on and he meets his match, his Uncle Laban. He tries to deceive him, and his Uncle Laban is deceiving him, right? He thinks he's marrying Le uh, Rachel, and he wakes up next to Leah. And so his life becomes what he has been named. What have you been named? Not your literal name, but what is that thing you have believed? Maybe your teacher said, "This is she's she's not smart enough." Maybe a, a man may have said, she, "She's not pretty enough." I don't know. What is it that you've been named? What did your mama, maybe in her anger, call you? A lot of us are living outside or living through these names that God did not give us. And so Jacob finds himself repeating this cycle. Because he believed what others had said about him. He believed what others had named him. And he gets to a point where he had to go home. Every one of us will come to this point where you've got to face yourself. You cannot step into being a chosen person, a marked person, a person walking in their true identity if you don't do the wrestle. you got to wrestle with the lies that you have believed about who you are. Some of us have believed that we're not lovable. I believe these lies because my fathers weren't there, that every man that would love me would leave, right? And so I was independent and I took care of myself. I didn't need anybody. Until one day God says, if you're gonna be a good wife to your husband, you need to learn God as your father. How is that connected? Well, my view of man was impacting my view of God. 
And so some of us are distant with God because we have distant fathers. Some of us can't open up to the Holy Spirit because our mom was really critical. And so we don't know how to be intimate. We don't know how to nurture. We don't know how to love. And so Jacob finds him in this place where he says, I, I've been running too long and he had to go back and face Esau. And God encounters him and he begins to wrestle with God. And what comes out of that wrestling is his true name. All of us in here have a spiritual name, something that God has destined for you. And it's not Deborah. You know everywhere you go, it's a woman is powerful. It's, you're a Deborah. No, there's more names than that, right? <laughs> I was in France one time, and we were doing a, uh, a ministry, and I've shared this before, but it's such a beautiful story. And this girl came up, and she was just crying. And I said, I feel like God wants to give you a new name. And she's like, God has been telling me he wants to give me a new name. And I said, I feel like your name should be Renee. And she said, that's what God told me. I said, let's look it up. And Renee meant new, new one or new name. So literally the name that she was thinking of is what God was naming her. But she needed that because she had lived such a horrible life. And God was telling her it's time to turn the leaf. I believe that this weekend, God is going to give you some new names. Yeah. You don't have to go to the store and change uh, the, the agency and change your name, but you got to believe it in your spirit. You got to know that you're a chosen one. You got to know that you're set apart and you got to step into your destiny. Yeah. The next thing that you have to fight for is the, the reason you were born. Every single person has a purpose. It doesn't matter how old you are. You can be 12, you can be 15, you can be 88. You were all born for something significant. And sometimes when we start talking about this, you're like, oh man, they're saying I gotta preach. No, 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 no. I don't know why we over-spiritualize uh, calling in the kingdom. We think every calling has to do with ministry. No, God may be raising you up to be a scientist that brings up a cure to a cancer. That is a calling. God may be calling you to be an artist that, that paints pictures of heaven and the glory that attracts people to the Lord. That is a calling. So how do we step into our purpose? All this stuff is in the bookmark that we'll have tomorrow. But you've got to be able to figure out what is the thing that you are willing to die for. Everyone has to have something that they're living for that they're willing to die for. What is your passion? Other people say you discover your passion by uh, asking yourself, what is the thing I do with the most ease and with the most effectiveness? Like I can do this easily. Nobody, I can plan events with my eyes closed, right? Like what is it that you do with the most ease and most effectiveness? You've got to go on this journey of saying, God, why did you make me? Let me give you a little clue, because we're talking about being chosen. And we're not chosen to shine. We're chosen to shine so that others can come to the kingdom of God. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Is it too late? Are you getting sleepy? No. All right, I want to make sure. So purpose, all of us have a collective purpose, which is to know God, to love God, and to serve God, right? To know God, to love God, and to serve God. So I don't know why I was born. You were born to know God. You were born to love God, and you were born to serve God. But the serving God, that's where comes your gifts and your talents. We all are made to serve God in unique ways. And this is what we call your assignment. And your assignment now, if you're in high school, is to get straight A's. That's your assignment. Because when you stand up there and you say you're the valedictorian and you're also a believer, guess who gets the glory? God. So that is your assignment. If you have little babies and you have to stay at home and work and not be able to work in your job that you have, your assignment is to raise arrows in this season, right? And so your assignment can shift, but you always need to ask, who's my boss? Your boss is not the man that you work for. Your boss is God. And because he's your, he's your boss, you know how to honor your natural boss. Don't be talking trash about your boss and you say you're a believer. Don't be gossiping about your co-workers and you say you love Jesus. You're called to be a light. You're called to be chosen. And if you're complaining, maybe you're not in your purpose. I'll give you these th three things really quickly. If the anointing is not there, this is how you know. You're not fruitful. What does fruitful mean? You do excellent work. You are producing something that is meaningful. 
And so sometimes we like to do things that we like, but the anointing is not there. I don't care how much you like singing, you, the anointing is not there when you sing. Right? Like, you know, my husband, you know, he's Nigerian, and she says, so he don't play. He's like, we, we don't do that in our house. Just have them play what they like. No, they need to be good at it. Right? Because we're going to be wasting a lot, a lot of money. There's certain things you can do because you like, but don't try to make a calling out of what you like. Make a calling out of what you're effective in. Make a calling out of what you're good at. Some of us have to say, well, I don't, I don't like this. I'm, but you're good at it. When you're good at something, God wants to do something with that. And it doesn't mean that you're going to have to do it all of your life. This is another thing that I see these days. Everybody wants to be a TikToker or a YouTuber, right? Quick money. It's not quick money. It took me, I've been, we built our business, we're going in our ninth, tenth year. When I first started out, everybody's like, y'all Facebook all the time. Well, I'm building something. Now everybody's catching up. Everybody's having webinars and all these things. But it took ten years to build a million dollar company. And we look at these people and we read these things. Oh, I see, earn six figures by doing this. Earn, everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. Don't do it. I'm thankful for the non-entrepreneurs. Because they have stable incomes. <laughs> but you've got to do something. There are seasons where it's not about your passion. There are seasons where it's not about your passion. I know we're in America. Everything is about how it makes you feel. But are you bearing fruit at it? How is God being glorified in it? And sometimes, even if we don't, we don't like how it makes us feel, it's still the Lord. Because growing fruit is hard work. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. How do you grow it? In hard seasons. But yeah, you want joy, you want peace, but what fruit is coming out of my life? All right? So you've got to figure out what your purpose is. The next thing is belonging. We all are called to belong somewhere. We first belong to the family of God. And when we come and give our life to Jesus, obviously you're invited into that family. But you need community. There is nothing that's going to come from the Lord that's not going to require other people. Some of us, oh, we don't do people. I, it's okay, I'm, I'm, I'm good by myself. I'll figure it out by myself. It's not a God dream then. It's not a God plan. If anything is coming from the heart of God, it's going to require you to rely on other people. And one of the things that the enemy has to break is independence. The enemy that the Lord has to break is independence. We love that here, right? I'm an independent woman, you know, throw your hands up at me, whatever that she says, right? And the Lord is like, oh man. Because the kingdom of God is fueled by dependence. We have to depend on each other. We have to trust each other. We have to walk in vulnerability. We have to be open. People are like, well, they didn't know I was going through all of that. You didn't tell anyone. Nobody here is going to dream about your problem. All right? Tell them what's going on in your life. They can't help you if you don't tell them. People get mad at the church. They get mad at the pastors. They can't, they can't dream about 500 people. Make a meeting and say, this is what's happening in my life. And God wants to move you into glory and move you from glory to glory. But you got to realize that you cannot do this life. You cannot do destiny. You cannot do purpose without people. And that's why the enemy attacks your relationships. Some of us are struggling with unforgiveness in this room. Unforgiveness from our parents to friendships to people who said something or you think they said something or someone said they said something. You never had a conversation. But you made up this whole story in your head. And oftentimes when that happens, is because there is destiny in that connection. Pastor B said this weekend, God wants to release a divine connections. You need to think about why you have friction with certain people. It's not always because you don't like their vibe, all right? And watch those vibes, because I don't know where they're all coming from. There's a lot of new age stuff out there on TikTok, all right? We say this spirit. Let me tell you something about their cult. They're a bunch of copycats. They're just a bunch of copycats. The spirit, the, the word tells us to discern the spirit of a, of a person. When you come around psychics, they're like, ooh, I love your aura. Ooh, no, 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 it's the Holy Spirit. Isn't this what you're attracted to? 
This is what you're in life to allow. It's not an all right. It's not an energy. This is the Holy Spirit. And when someone has bad energy, they have a demon. That's what it is. This generation is so hungry for that stuff. It's because they're tired of religion. Yeah. And the politics of America did a number on this generation. And so they're so tired of church. And the enemy said, aha, there's a loophole. Let me begin to bring in some of these lies. Let me begin to bring in some of this deception. But that's why we have to be the Romans 8 people. Those are the sons of God that are manifested with great power. You need to be able to pray for people in your cafeteria and they get healed and they say, I want your energy. And you say, this energy is called the Holy Ghost. And you pray for them and you pray for the Lord. That's what this generation is looking for. They're not looking for magic. They're looking, they're, they were made for wonder. We were all made for wonder. We were made for something bigger than ourselves. And so they're going to look to things like angel numbers and all these things when really they're just looking for the glory. And if you can introduce them to the purity of the glory, they will never hunger again. They will never thirst again. Don't fall for those traps. There is something more glorious and more powerful than this pseudo spiritual stuff that's going on right now. The next thing you need to master, I said belonging, we, you have to find your people. You have to find your tribe. In the church, if a church is bigger, join a small group or join a department. You gotta find your people. You cannot do this by yourself. The last thing is meaning. Why am I here? Meaning is the same in, in, in a way to purpose, but meaning also drives what you will leave behind. Every single one of us are destined to leave something behind. Our church is named Legacy and our tagline is leaving a legacy of God in the earth. All of you guys are made to make a deposit. It doesn't matter if you're six or 60. There is something when you are dead and gone a hundred years from now that they will say about you. And you get to decide what that is. You get to write your obituary now. You get to write out the legacy that God has for you. But you gotta lean into the Holy Spirit. You gotta develop a relationship with God. You gotta spend time in worship. Your mama's prayers are not gonna carry you, right? You have to get to the point where you're worshiping God. You're, you're going after the things of God, amen? amen? So what every person must decide, this is a decision that you make now. You don't make a decision about who you're gonna be in crisis in the middle of a crisis. You don't prepare to succeed when you need to succeed. You prepare to succeed before the pressure is there for you to succeed. I taught last week on a sermon with the three Hebrew boys. Before they were thrown into the fire, they already made some decisions. They said, God can save us. We believe that. But even if he doesn't, we believe that. And so they lived in this place of unity and they were not gonna bow because they already made the decision. Some of us are like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, if pressure comes and there's a gun to my head and I have to say I love Jesus, I know I'm gonna say it. But you can't even say it in worship. <laughs> oh, I know I'm gonna not get, I'm not, I'm not gonna lose my virginity when I'm in, the, in, in, in pressure, but you're not even watching what you're watching. You make a decision to succeed before you're in the pressure. Success is not uh, um, an accident. People don't just make it in whatever their walk with God and their career because they thought it. They didn't manifest it. You gotta work. Yeah. Even scripture tells you faith without work is what? Yeah. Dead. And so you gotta make a decision about who you're gonna be. When I'm dating, this is who I'm gonna be. I'm not having sex. Before I'm married, I am waiting. I'm going to make a decision within two weeks whether someone is somebody I need to talk to or not. That's what I told the Lord, right? I had this whole big plan. I said, God, at 25, I'm going to be married. At 28, I'm going to have my first kid. I had this whole big plan. Because when I was 13, the Lord told me, you don't have a lot of boyfriends, all right? Because you're marked. You're set apart. You're chosen. You're not going to be dating around. We don't do that here in holiness, all right? And so I knew. 
And so I dated one person in high school and one person after that. And then it was just like, okay, okay, my, I see my time here. Thank you very much. Um, I was like, okay, Lord. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do about this? Sorry, the time threw me off a little bit. I'm like, it's negative five. So that means I'm after, okay, five minutes late. All right, let me think about how I'm going to round everything up. All right, do I tell you about the boyfriend or not? Okay, let me. Let me. So, so essentially what I, I told the Lord, I don't have a lot of time to waste, right? And so I said, God, if somebody is not for me, let me know that they're not for me in the first two weeks. All this, oh, we're going to talk for six months and try to please oh, the devil. Can you imagine? Oh, we've been together for six years. We have children. He's going to marry me one day. No, he's not. I'm sorry to tell you. A man knows whether or not he wants you within three weeks. Three weeks. Now, whether he marries you or not, that's you know based on circumstances. And so the first one that my, my spiritual parents prayed for me, and they're like, oh, at 28, finally, the, the God has lifted the veil. The men are going to be able to see you. They're coming, right? And boy, they came from the woodworks. Like every, 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 like after two days, my mom is like, I had a dream, Faith. I'm like, oh, Jesus. He had holes in his pockets, Faith. I'm like, okay. All right, bye. I had a dream every night, right? But God wasn't just telling my mom that signs were there. And I always tell young people that the red, the red lights are there, but y'all just like to run them. True. True. You knew that person was going to be yeah. too. We know. <laughs> they come to marriage counseling, and I'm like, but you knew he was like this before you married him. What come did you think was going to change? Just because he said, I do? Hey. That's right. So the Lord is teaching us how to make decisions about who we're going to be, who we're going to bring into our sphere. These are destiny decisions. The person you marry has the biggest impact on whether or not you're going to achieve the call of God on your life. That doesn't mean everybody has to be married, because some are not going to be married. But if you marry, they're either going to propel you or derail you. And you need to make those decisions beforehand. And don't say, well, I'm just dating around right now, because they will steal your virtue in those dating seasons. And I have seen prophetic women, especially women that are chosen, women that are marked, hook up with the wrong person and end up going around the same mountain for five years when God could have gotten you to the promised land in 40 days. But he was so cute. <laughs> Let's finish up here. Let's finish up. So we've got to make these decisions. The beginning of feeling chosen is knowing that you are, one, an intentional design, that you're thought of. Two, that you were thought of before time. I don't care what lies the enemy has tried to tell you. Even right now, God, you're on God's mind. That you are marked. Marked means set apart, just like chosen. But when you're marked, there is a mark on you. And you wonder why some people are jealous and you didn't say anything, right? It's because you're marked. You wonder why that person is not, you know, asking you out on a date. It's because the worth of your life they can't even comprehend. Because you're marked. You're set apart. Don't always be discouraged when God blocks people. Because he has something greater on the other side. Don't minimize the God that is in you. Don't minimize the strength that you have. I always said, you know, guys, the, the, the little ones that came around that had holes in their pockets, they're like, you're so intimidating. You're so driven. I don't want to be married to you because you're so prophetic. You're going to know everything I'm doing. I'm like, well, why are you doing something you shouldn't be doing, right? And so for a minute, I was like, oh, maybe, maybe I need to do the time. But if the things were glorifying God, I didn't need to change them. And sure enough, the first thing my husband said to me is that I bet most men are intimidated by you, but I'm not. And that's how I knew he was the one. The other thing about being chosen is you got to know that you're set apart for good work. You're set apart for good work. Amen. You no longer seek validation from outside, right? When you know who you are, you're going to seek validation from the Lord. You're going to stop the perfectionism. Where it's, I try to earn God's love, God's approval. He loves you because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you. He cannot pray enough. He cannot give enough. Those things are great, but that doesn't earn you love. He loves you because he loves you. You know that you are a chosen person when you're not afraid of the future. 
Anxiety is crippling people in this age. And that's because we think we have to step into our future by ourselves. My definition of anxiety is when we, we think we don't understand that God is in our future. And therefore we are anxious because we have to do it with our own strength. Lastly, you're a chosen person when you know you are called to fight for your future. You've got to be able to see that you were made for something more. Let's go ahead and stand on our feet. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your goodness. Just lay hands on your heart and just declare after me, Father. Father. Declare it like you have a father. 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 Thank you. Thank you. For choosing me. Father. Father. Thank you. For setting, me apart. for setting me apart. I declare I am not my past. I declare I am not my history. I break every generational curse on my life. I break every hindrance and every barrier. 